Hello, everybody. Hi, everybody. How are y'all doing? We're here. We're here. We're here. We're good. We're good. Yeah. Yep. It's, a, it's amazing weather. A lot of people are commenting on the weather out there. It's so cool for the beginning of August. It's yes. been nice walking for a few days now, yeah. you know, but it's going to come to an end and then it's going to be misery again out there when I walk. But that's okay. Then so we, we got just, September around yeah. the corner, then October. Just yep. gotta take advantage of those nice, the we nice do. days, and not, you we know, do. not miss them, because um, it, it's nice. Mm. It's nice yeah. to sit outside. It, feels, it is. It feels good. It feels like you're back in the world. Yeah. It really does. Yeah. So, anyway. But we are in the world here, at least our world, at least, and we're glad that you are here. Um, so, anyway, I'll remind you that. On Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, I'll be starting a new series on hope, entitled Living Hope, where living is a verb, because it's about actually living out the hope that is right. ours now in Christ. Yes. So we'll be talking about all the dimensions of hope and, and, and living out that hope every do you, day. Do you know that our, our eternity, yours and mine, will be in hope? <laughs> because we have spot number hope 18 in the columbarium, so we will be hopeful because uh, for those of you who don't know, there are three sections of like Alan Berry and St. Andrew there. What are the three? Hope? I think it's Faith, Hope, and Love. Faith, Hope, and Love, and we're in the Hope section. We're Hope 18. We're Hope 18, we, yes. If, if there's any spots around us still, remember, we are going to be doing Friday, 5 p.m. <laughs> happy hours. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm a little goofy, but... It's okay. It's all right. Good. But we really will be doing the happy hours. <laughs> if, it, if it's at all possible. <laughs> okay, okay. I, think I, I think I better stop and I let think you I better open pray. us in prayer. <laughs> Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we are grateful to be here again on this Tuesday and resuming our journey through the book of Genesis. And we just pray as we do every single week that your Holy Spirit really will open these pages up for us. Help us to take these stories in, if we've heard them before, to see something new on this journey through um the age of the patriarchs and and help us grasp that these are indeed our own stories the stories that we are part of this family of faith that we are we are abraham's descendants by faith all this we pray in Jesus' name amen amen okay Alrighty. very cool so let me swing back around here get things Oops, get things set up. Okay, so very good. So we are in the midst of the 25th chapter of Genesis. We are in the stories of Isaac, but typically if you look at study Bibles or commentaries, the section is hardly even named the stories of Isaac, because actually in Genesis you get a lot of stories of Abraham. You get a lot of stories of Jacob and his sons, but you really don't get much about Isaac. Um, certainly the most significant Isaac story is the one we had a couple of weeks ago when we talked about um, Abraham being uh, called by God to uh, sacrifice Isaac. And um, But today we will be in some of these stories of Isaac and a little bit about uh that um, Isaac and Rebekah's son, sons, Esau and Jacob. Now, one other thing. We would tend to, I think, if we were writing this story, we would write it chronologically. And we would strive to get that correct. Because that's just kind of who we are, and it's the age we live in, and we live in a world with, filled with calendars and clocks, and we wear clocks on our wrists and the rest of it. It wasn't really that way in the ancient world. There writings were often much more topical, topically arranged. So today, um, scholars debate exactly what's going on in the chronology of this, because you're introduced to Isaac's kids, and then you get a story in which he doesn't seem to have any kids, at least on the surface of it. And so I'm just asking that we all not worry too much about that, that kind of thing. Um, the writer wants to tell us the stories of Isaac, um, so that we can come to appreciate how Jacob came to be the father of the 12 tribes. So with that, I think we're just going to... <laughs> oh, Susan Faulkner said she's in Hope 19. Well, there wow. we go. Wow! <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, the Linda Waldo said to count her in for the happy hours. Okay, too, well, so. we, we, we will. It's not that big a place. You can find your way from one, one corner to another, right? <laughs> so, in spirit. In, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so we're in the 25th chapter, and we are the 19th verse. And this is going to tell the story of um, the birth of Jacob and Esau. So this is the, verse 19, this is the account of the family line of Abraham's son, Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, from Paddan Aram, and sister of Laban, the Aramean. So, um... We got the story of um, Isaac and Rebecca's uh, marriage last week and how she came to be his wife and Abraham wanted a, a daughter-in-law from the larger family tribe and so the servant makes a trip northward, finds Rebecca. She agrees to come. She makes a trip southward um, and um, in this great moment, I think, we are told that Jacob loved her. And it's just, you know, it's 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 pretty cool. But we know that Rebecca and Isaac are closely related. They're basically first cousins, I guess second cousins, because they're one generation apart. Isaac is Abraham's son. Rebecca is a um, daughter of Bethuel, who is the son of Nahor, Abraham's brother. So there's a, there's a generation apart there as well. So 21. Isaac prayed to Yahweh on behalf of his wife because she was childless. Okay, so Isaac is 40 when they marry, and Rebekah enters a period. At this point, um, we don't know how long it is, but it's long enough that Abra Isaac is praying for her because she is not getting pregnant. She is childless. Okay? Yahweh answered his prayer, and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. So here is another one of these stories there. Scriptures really replete with them. The stories of um, uh, where God intervenes so that the woman becomes pregnant. And here it is with Rebecca, who is childless. Um, Isaac prays to God for her and she becomes pregnant. Verse 22. Now the babies... Okay, so... Right off, we know what? There's at least two. At least two. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of Yahweh. So she's got at least two, okay? And they're down there moving around and jumping and around, babies do, and I'm sure she's uncomfortable and upset and... I'm not sure what's going on. And so she goes and asks of Yahweh um, what's happening to her. And so God says to her, two nations are in your womb. Okay? So this is this will be two great families. The patriarchs of those families are in your womb. And two peoples from within you will be separated. They will go their own ways, these two children inside Rebecca's womb. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. Hmm. So they're going to be both the patriarchs of big families. They are going to be separated. One tribe will be stronger than the other tribe, and the older will serve the younger. And of course, in the ancient world, worked like much of the world did until not that long ago, when it would be the the norm would be the reverse that the younger would serve the older, right? That the older would have which which we'll see in a bit. The older would have uh, 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 privileges, would have a birthright, would have a blessing that would not be extended to the second or the third or the fourth. So this is a reversal again, where the older is going to serve the younger. All right. So so God has told Rebecca this. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they, so they named him Esau. Okay? Um, 
Esau may mean hairy, it says. So. Yes, yeah. It's, Esau is one of those names. Some Bibles will print that it may mean hairy. Others just don't because it's, you know, it's just sort of maybe this is what's going on. But like a, so many biblical names are related to the story. They're related to what happens. Might be the place, might be something that happens. So in this case, the, the Esau, the, the, the first one um, to come out, is, is a real hairy hairy baby with red hair okay I can kind of picture that my my youngest brother Alan had a lot of hair when he was a little kid in fact when he was still when he was too young to take anywhere a barber came to cut his hair on the top of his head he had a lot of hair still has a lot of hair okay I on the other hand have not been blessed in that way. So um, the first to come out was red. His whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob, which means, must mean like grasping or something. Okay? So um, the firstborn. They're twins, grant you, but still, even in twins, one comes out first, and and that's Esau. And so he is the older. He is the firstborn. And the second is Jacob. But Jacob comes out grasping Esau's heel, which I think is supposed to be a little bit of a clue to what, to what comes next. So Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. So now we know how long Rebekah had been waiting to have a child and Isaac because we're told that Isaac was 40 when they married he's 60 when the twins are born so Rebecca had been childless for 20 years and so they are getting old and um, as we've talked about before the childlessness for Rebecca would be a source of, of pain and really shame for her and so this is just a great great moment um, but she understands certain things about these twins that other people wouldn't because she prayed to God and God told her, and there's nothing in here about God saying this to anybody else, about um, the older serving the younger. The older being Esau, the younger being Jacob. Okay. Verse 27. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country. A man's man. A I man's like man, an outdoors man, <laughs> happy hunting, killing animals, skinning them, bringing it all home. A man's man, right? This, right? Yeah, yeah. While Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents, meaning Jacob was content to stay at home among the women. Because the men would go out, all go out hunting and doing man stuff, and the women would stay with the tents and in the uh, um, village of tents that would be set up. And Jacob is happy to be there. So, very contrasting twins in this. So, what do we know so far? We know the older one Esau. He's very hairy, with red hair. He's a man's man. He's like on the cover. He's like on the brownie, brawny towels, except with red hair, right? In fact, there's this one actor I'm thinking of who was in Game of Thrones. This huge guy with red hair. You know, what I'm thinking yes, of with a big I red do. beard. Maybe some of you know who I'm thinking of. Yeah. So that's who I picture now with Esau. That guy. I um, Jacob on the other hand, not so much. Happy mending tents and making stew or whatever else would happen at home among the tents. So Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, and Rebecca loved Jacob. So each parent has their favorite. Right? So here's the truth about humankind. Every parent would swear to their children, most would, that they don't have favorites. That's just not, they love them all equally. They love them all the same. The truth is, 
Sometimes. It isn't always like that. Yeah. Sometimes it's different than that. And sometimes a parent will have a favorite. Um, sometimes a parent will have a big favorite. In this case, they've each got a favorite, and they're pretty big favorites. Isaac is all about the outdoors. He likes the wild meat. He's all about bringing home the, you know, the fruit of the hunt. And Rebecca, on the other hand, likes the fact that Jacob wants to hang out at home, help out around the house, whatever. Any observations on that, Patty? No. 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 We got the contrast pretty well we do. down. Yes, we do. Okay. So now we're going to get an incident that it's going to move this story along about these two twins. Once, when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country and he was famished. I mean starving. Have you ever been, I bet he was mean hungry. What do they call it now? Hangry. Hangry. Yes. Hangry. That's a new word in the last, I don't know, decade. He's hangry. I have been hangry. You know, your blood sugar bottoms out. You just have to eat something. You just have to. Well, that's how Esau is. He is starving. He's famished. And he said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red, <laughs> red stew. I'm famished. Now we get a parens. That is why he was also called Edom. Edom means red. Edom will become the name of the tribe of Esau. And if you look at subsequent maps of the time or whatever, you'll see there were people called the Edomites. The land of Edom. That is the land where Esau will go because you and I both know that the promise goes from Abraham to Isaac and Isaac to Jacob and Jacob to his 12 sons. So this is the first part of the story about how these two twins will separate and how one, how the, the, the older will serve the younger. Okay, so now we know that Esau will also be known as Edom. Okay, verse 31, Jacob replied, well, first, sell me your birthright. So, Jake, so Jacob makes this outlandish offer to his brother, which seems crazy on the surface, that Jacob will give him stew, he will feed his brother, but only if the brother gives Jacob his birthright as compensation, as payment. Sell me your birthright. Wow, just let me explain what birthrights are. And this is not unique to the... Um, to to these um, ancient Hebrews, the Israelites. We know about this from other cultures around, have other instances of selling birthrights and stuff. So the way it worked was this. The birthright carried with it two things principally. One, a blessing that would be given from the father to the oldest son. And the second piece is that the oldest son would get a double share of the inheritance. So imagine that um, when Isaac dies, he leaves $300,000. That's his estate. It would be chopped up into three pieces, 100000 each. Two of those shares would go to Esau. One share would go to Jacob. So Esau would get 200000 Jacob would get 100000 That's what a birthright is. Now, they don't have money in this sense, so it would be a double share of principally really the livestock and whatever precious metals they had. That would be um, uh, the largest portion of it. So Jacob says, well, see, yeah, I'm going to give you some stupid sell me your birthright. And Esau says, look, I am about to die. <laughs> now, I don't think he's really about to die. So we're getting the idea that Esau is, I don't know. I don't want to be mean. Not the brightest bulb? Maybe, I don't know. But he says, look, I am about to die. What good is a birthright to me? So he astonishingly says that I am willing to give you, my brother, my birthright if you'll give me a bowl of stew. People do foolish things. People can be impulsive. One of the things we're supposed to grow out of is impulsiveness, right? I've read that teenagers are, they've not yet matured to the point to, 
to become less impulsive. And that's something that can get teenagers into trouble, especially if they don't realize that about themselves. So Esau, we don't know how old the two of them are, but Esau here is you know, I'm just thinking, not thinking I'm about this. I'm just thinking about something. Though. Okay. My sister is a severe, severe, brittle one type diabetic. Yes. And there are times that she feels, it comes over her so fast that she feels so bad. Like if she doesn't have something to eat right then, I mean, I think she would feel like she was going to die. Maybe, I mean, we've always kind of joked about this and being silly, but... There is a possibility. I don't know. You may be onto something. I don't think I've seen this in any commentaries that what could be happening here is that Esau is actually is severely diabetic. He could be. And he is actually on the verge of death unless he gets or something to eat. Or hypoglycemic. It, it could actually be a a real thing. A medical it condition. could be a thing. could be. I don't I, know. I've seen it. I've seen it in my system. But he is still going to give away a whole lot for oh, he a is. bowl of stew. He is. As opposed, you would think what he would do is he would say to his brother the homebody give me some stew or I'll beat the crap out of you, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know but yeah famous story here of the you know Esau selling his birthright to, to his brother Jacob for a bowl of stew so Esau says look I'm about to die what good is birthright to me and Jacob says well swear to me first right um, these sorts of oaths were taken very, very seriously in in their world. They were not offered lightly. If you, if you swore an oath, you were expected to keep it by everybody. So Jacob said, swear to me first. So Esau swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew, bean stew, right? He ate and drank and got up and left. And then the writer says, so Esau despised his birthright. Meaning, the writer understands that Esau did not value his birthright. He didn't value what was his by birth, what his father would have wanted him to have by birth. Esau is Isaac's Jacob. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> Esau is Isaac's favorite. Okay. Um, Isaac would want Esau to have this birthright, and now Esau despised it, didn't think it was worth anything, gave it away for a bowl of stew, diabetes or not. Okay? Any other thoughts, Betty? No. That was a cool one, though. I like that. I, it, just saying. You are thinking creatively. Okay, so, so that's the first story to lock away in your head around Esau and Jacob. And now we're going to have an interlude. Chapter 26 is really kind of divorced from exactly what came before. When you read it, you kind of think it happened before Esau and Jacob were born. But I don't know. I don't know. And, and commentators are divided on it. Most of them, you know, don't really care that much because this is how it came written to us. So, chapter 26, verse 1. Now, there was a famine in the land not uncommon for that part of the world besides the previous famine in Abraham's time because you remember Abraham Abraham had to deal with famines as well and moved to a different part of the world to escape it so this is a new famine and Isaac went to Abimelech king of the Philistines in Gerar so all right now we know about some of this we have met Abimelech before and scholars argue about whether this is the same Abimelech. That probably 75 years have passed, but lifetimes are still long. And Abraham lived 175 years, so most agree that really the writer understands that this Abimelech is the same Abimelech that Abraham had dealt with earlier. Remember all about the wells and all that kind of stuff. Going back a few chapters. So Abimelech, his city, um, uh, is, is Gerar, and I brought a little map just to show you where it is. Okay, so if you find the white arrow, it's pointing to Gerar. You can see Beersheba is, is just southeast of it. 
This land where Beersheba is and Gerar is, is really the southern boundary of Canaan. From there south, it just increasingly turns barren and brown. Um, from there north, it is increasingly fertile and green. Um, this is the really when the when the tribes move into is to uh, Canaan centuries later, Beersheba and Gerar are at the southern end of that. And if you look on the map that I have here, you'll see Philistia on the coast. That is the land of the Philistines. But this is a map meant to serve many centuries. We have no evidence whatsoever that the Philistines were there before the 12th century BC, which is long centuries after the stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So what gives? Why do we call why why are these people called the Philistines in chapter 26? Well, there's two things going on with that. One, it could simply help the reader understand the area we're talking about. But it is also possible that there were Aegean people, the Philistines came from the Aegean Sea, the Greek islands up there and settled on the coast here, that these are also Aegean people who came to this same area as they would when they would they were seafaring people and they would come and they would land on the coast. So, um, but just understand that the, there's no direct connection between the people of Abimelech and the Philistines whom Samson faces or the Philistines who uh, King Saul has to fight. Uh, remember, uh, Goliath is a Philistine. So that's a later people, but here we go. They're all the same. I do want to point out one thing on the map here, Patty. Yes. That Gerar and the little dot? Yes. I added those to the map myself. What? Is that not impressive or what? You did amazing. They were, it was not on the map. I, I put it on there, did the dot, did the whole thing. I'm, I'm very proud. I'm, I'm pleased with myself. So there we go. Okay. I know Steve Wilson loves your map. So, <laughs> Steve, I hope that this is something that you approve of too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my. You, you know, you... you 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 you're living under COVID long enough, cooped up inside. You just get kind of crazy. So <laughs> Isaac is going to go to the south to escape um, the famine, uh, go to a city just like his father Abraham did, and the same king is in charge. That's the way I would read this. Verse two: Yahweh appeared to Isaac and said to him, "Do not go down to Egypt." Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while, and I will be with you, and I will bless you. So he's telling Isaac to head south, but not all the way to Egypt. Just It's going to turn out to be just as far as Gerar near Beersheba. Okay? So, now we're going to get a reiteration of the promise that God has made. And it's going to be pretty much the same thing that God had promised Abraham. Now it's Isaac. Why? Because Isaac is a child of the promise. For to you and, and to your descendants, I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and will give them all these lands. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. There's the big one again. It's that big one all nations on the earth will be blessed. That tells you this is the beginning of a rescue project that is meant for all humankind. And as Christians, we believe that this rescue project comes to its culmination in Jesus. Okay, verse 5. Because Abraham obeyed me and did everything I required of him, keeping my commands, my decrees, and my instructions. So Abraham was obedient and faithful to God. The same thing is going to be expected of Isaac. The same thing is going to be expected of Jacob. The same thing is going to be expected of this family all the way moving forward. We're going to find out some in Genesis, more importantly later, that, that they aren't able to be faithful to God as they should be. Um, that's, that's kind of where the book of Exodus takes us. But nonetheless, this is how God sets it forth. That Abraham has been faithful, that the promise goes on, 
and Isaac is the recipient of that promise. And Isaac is going to be Isaac is going to be obedient here. He stays in Gerar, does not go on down to Egypt, just like God had said. Verse seven. Now this will sound familiar to you. Oh yeah. So I want you to look for the differences from the two stories like this about Abraham. When Isaac had been there a long time, this is in the city of Gerar, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked down from a window and saw Isaac caressing his wife, Rebekah, which is like really sweet, right? So he's out there in public. It's a little, what do we call it? What are they called? A PDA. It's a public display of affection, right? Yes. Yeah, I am right. And, and the king sees it. The king sees it. On the surface, so what? But, verse 9, So Abimelech summoned Isaac and said, She is really your wife. Why did you say she is my sister? So this is one of the first differences in the story, right? Rebecca is never taken into the household of the Pharaoh or the household of Abimelech in the earlier story. She is with um, Isaac and but we do find out that Isaac has still been passing her off as his sister, as his father did. I guess it's like father, like son. But Abimelech catches Isaac in this lie. She is really your wife. Why did you say she is my sister? And then Isaac says, because I thought I might lose my life on account of her. And again, we're left with really, really Abimelech said, well, what is this you have done to us? One of the men might well have slept with your wife and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech gave orders to all the people, anyone who harms this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. So here somehow this has ended up in a situation where the king of the city, the king of these people, these Philistines as they're called, gives his protection to Isaac and to Rebekah. And certainly this would be seen as a moment of, you know, God's providence at work. That God's purposes involve Isaac and Rebekah. They need to be safe. They need to be moved forward. And so the king unknowingly, right, is the agent of God's purposes and God's protection just like many, many centuries, a millennium and a half later, when King Cyrus of the Persians begins to allow the Jewish exiles to return to Jerusalem after their Babylonian captivity. Does Cyrus understand what's happening? Does he understand that he is serving God's purposes? Nobody is. He is. It's a good understanding of providence. Okay, so... Verse 12, now Isaac planted crops in that land and in the same year reaped a hundredfold because Yahweh had blessed him. Now, hundredfold is super extravagant. In that, in that part of the world, um, uh, crops would typically return like a sevenfold harvest. So whatever, however much grain you put down, you'd get, you'd get seven times that back in your crop. So here it's a hundredfold, super, super extravagant, over the top, um, um, and the, why? Because God has blessed him. And the man became rich, Isaac, and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. Isaac had so many flocks and herds and servants that the Philistines envied him. Why? because he has God's blessing. So the Philistines now envy him. What does it mean to envy him? It means to be bitter because Isaac has it better. That's what envy is, feeling bitter because others have it better. So, verse 15, so all the wells that his father, that Abraham's servants had dug in the time of Abraham, the Philistines closed them all up, filling them up with earth. Because if you went back and read those stories, you know that Abraham 
dug a well out in the land between the land of Gerar and the land of, of, of Canaan. And he, so here they've gone and they're just so upset and so envious of Isaac that they close up these wells and wells are life. This is a very arid part of the world, very dry. Water is everything. The great pagan, the great god of the Canaanites is a god named Baal. And what distinguishes their god Baal is that god, their, Baal is the uh, bringer of rain because rain is life. Water is life for these people who live in semi-arid or desert climates. So wells are crucial. And here they're so mad at Isaac, they are actually filling up these wells and closing them up and filling them with, with earth. Then Abimelech himself said to Isaac, move away from us. You have become too powerful for us. Too rich, too powerful, too successful. They feel threatened by him. It's a little bit like um, at a later time when the Pharaoh grows fearful of the Hebrews. Abimelech sends them away. Pharaoh enslaves the Hebrews um, at the beginning of the book of Exodus. But they, um, in this case, Abimelech is fearful and says, you have to leave now. I'm not comfortable having you around. So Isaac moved away from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar where he settled. And that is just to the east of the city. Isaac reopened the wells that had been dug in the time of his father Abraham, which the Philistines had stopped up after Abraham died. And he gave them the same names his father had given them. So Isaac goes back out, opens up the wells again. Isaac's servants dug in the valley and discovered a well of fresh water there. But the herders of Gerar quarreled with those of Isaac and said, The water is ours. So he named the well Esek because they disputed with him. And the word Esek means like contentious or disputed. Then they dug another well, but they quarreled over that one also. So he named it Sitna, which also means quarrel or contentious or something. He moved on from there and dug another well, and no one quarreled over it. He named it Rehoboth. Um, What does Rehoboth mean, Patty? Let's see. I need to pause and see. I can't. It won't come up on my iPad. So I will resort to my. Um, I'm just. We're gonna. We can take a brief pause here. I gotta put on good the right glasses. Ah, yes, that's what was in my brain, but I couldn't call it up. It means room or like a big wide space. Okay. So. He named it Rehoboth, saying the Lord has given us room and we will flourish in the land. So it's kind of a reminder of, you know, God's promise that this land of Canaan is actually going to be belong to Abraham's family. They will have to end up having to fight for it as the centuries go by. But yep, yep, that's the way it's supposed to be. So now he's got this one well he called Rehoboth. And from there he went up to Beersheba. Okay, remember Beersheba is oh, an important place just to the southeast of Gerar, also just on that southern boundary, if you want to think about it that way, of the land of Canaan. So Isaac has gone to Beersheba. Um, that night, Yahweh appeared to him and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bless you and will increase the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. Isaac built an altar there and called on the name of Yahweh. There he pitched his tent and there his servants dug a well. Meanwhile, Abimelech had come to him from Gerar with Ahuzas, his personal advisor, and Phicol, the commander of his forces. And Isaac asked him, well, why have you come to me? since you were hostile to me and sent me away. They answered, We saw clearly that Yahweh was with you, so we said there ought to be a sworn agreement between us, between us and you. Let us make a treaty with you that you will do us no harm, just as we did not harm you but have always treated you well and sent you away peacefully, and now you are blessed by the Lord. So 
how is this story unfolding if you're if you're an Israelite? You're living centuries later, and you're hearing this story told. Um, it's a story about God looking after this family. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the rest of the succeeding generation. God's providence. God looking after them. And when God is on your side, people will see it. And in this case, Abimelech, and uh, his commanders see it and they want to treat him because they believe that the God of Isaac has enriched him and made him powerful and they want to him as an ally not an enemy right so Isaac then made a feast for them and they ate and they drank, and early the next morning, the men swore an oath to each other. Then Isaac sent them on their way, and they went away peacefully. That day, Isaac's servants came and told him about the well they had dug, and they said, We found water, and he called it Sheba, and to this day the name of the town has been Beersheba. Okay? So... Got that whole long story yeah. between these sto more really kind of more interesting stories about Jacob and Esau and it's there to tell us um, to tell the descendants of these people that God has blessed their family is looking out for their family um, even a mighty king like Abimelech uh, is going to see it and so it really just kind of builds up the family and strengthens them. I imagine that later in history when the Israelites are oppressed um, and feeling defeated and feeling abandoned by God, that this is the kind of story they would look back on and say, you know, this is who we are. God has blessed us. and God will be on our side and will rescue us. So, okay, so any thoughts or questions about that about that story uh, no you didn't I don't think no it's just not the kind of story that that's gonna do too much of that so what let's march on for a bit here so Jacob here's what we gotta remember Jacob now has the birthright he saw sold it to him for a bowl of stew bean stew Verse 34, when Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, daughter of Beeri the Hittite, and also Basemath, daughter of Elon the Hittite. They were a source of grief to Isaac and Rebekah. Who's the they? The two daughters-in-law. You wish you knew more, but you don't. But it is beginning to further emphasize the coming separation between Jacob and Esau. Okay? So. Chapter 27. Anything before we start this, Patty? No. Okay, no. here we go then. When Isaac was old, and his eyes were so weak that he could no longer see, he called for Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son. And Esau first, of course, said, Here I am. And Isaac said, I'm now an old man, really old, and I don't know the day of my death. So get your equipment, get your quiver, get your bow, your arrows, go out in the open country to hunt some wild game for me. We learned earlier that he really likes that. And he says, prepare me the kind of tasty food I like and bring it to me to eat so that I may give you my blessing before I die. This is the blessing that is due the older son, and it would be taken very seriously. We, we think we've lost touch with all of that, but in their world, this blessing is a very serious thing, an important thing. It's Isaac's gift to his son, his beloved son, because who does Isaac prefer? Esau. Verse 5. Now Rebekah was listening as Isaac spoke to his son Esau. 
When Esau left for the open country to hunt game and bring it back, Rebekah said to her son, Jacob, look, I overheard your father say to your brother Esau, bring me some game, prepare me some tasty food to eat so that I may give you my blessing in the presence of Yahweh before I die. And then she says, so now Jacob, here's what we're going to do, my son. Listen carefully and do what I tell you. Go out to the flock and bring me two choice young goats so that I can prepare some tasty food for your father just the way he likes it. Then take it to your father to eat so that he may give you his blessing before he dies. Is the blessing meant for Jacob? No, it is meant for Esau. What is Isaac's, it's Isaac's blessing to give. What does Isaac want to do? To give that blessing to Esau. What does Rebekah want to do? She wants Jacob to get that blessing. And so Rebekah is willing to connive against her husband, Isaac, to steal the blessing from Esau and get it to Jacob. It's... It's something like this that reminds us that these stories are not like Aesop's fables. In Aesop's fables, there's always a moral point to be made, right? That's not how these stories are. These stories are not about, they don't all have a moral to them. These people are not moral exemplars for us. It's not a good thing that she is conniving against her husband. How could that, is she being faithful to her husband? Faithful to Isaac? Well, he, she's not. So the fact that God might use her unfaithfulness to carry forward God's promises doesn't mean that her faithfulness is a good thing. I saw Patty held up the que question what? sign. Patty's made up little signs over there. <laughs> she has one with a question mark on it. Huge question marks. So Huge question marks so it. I can see it. Yes. yes. Linda Rivera has a good question. She asks, would Isaac have known about the deal between Jacob and Esau, like regarding the birthright? Would he have known about that? Such a good question. Text doesn't tell us. What would we think? I think he probably does. A lot of time has passed. Isaac's now really old. I don't see how it could have not ever come up. Um, and so, yeah, good question. So I, th my answer would be yes. Maybe we'll get a clue a little bit later. I can't actually remember. That's why it's always good to read these stories in detail because the little things that come out in different places. And I've been through this more than a few times. And, but so let's just press on. So, okay. So Rebecca's going to go out and she's going to take a couple of young goats and, and cook them up. And I guess she's going to spice them up a lot or something because in theory, they're not supposed to taste like goat when they get to Isaac. Right? Because Isaac would know, no, these are our goats. This isn't like wild bear or whatever <laughs> Esau might bring back. So Jacob said to his mother, my brother Esau is a hairy man. I, on the other hand, have smooth skin. What do they call that now? When guys shave off their hair and all that stuff? I don't even know. <laughs> I don't know I think it's called a like, name for it. I don't know, but yeah, yeah, it's kind of a thing. But in this case, my, he says, my brother Esau's a hairy man while I have smooth skin. What if my father touches me? I would appear to be tricking him. I would bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. And his mother said to him, my son, let the curse fall on me. Just do what I say. Go and get him for me. So clearly the writer wants us to grasp that Rebecca is in charge of this. Yeah. She is the chief conniver. Is Jacob going to prove guilty as well? Yes, because he does it. He's but his mom, Rebecca, is the chief conniver. Jacob is her favorite. And now we realize he is her favorite by a lot. Oh, Bill Warren. Thank it's you, Bill Warren. It's called manscaping. Bill Warren Thanks, said it's called Bill. manscaping. Thanks, Bill. I won't ask Bill how he knows. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. So like, wow. So Rebecca, 
is Jacob is very much her favorite. And she is in charge of this, and she is working this plot, and she just wants, needs Jacob to do what he's told. So, he went, and he got the goats, and he brought them to his mother, and she prepared some tasty food, just the way his father liked it. Don't you like how much, how, the, how much detail the writer is taking with yeah. this? She prepared some tasty food. Just the way his father liked it. Must have lots of spices. In Has to be, because he's old, right? He needs spices. Ah. and. But know. also, it's not wild game. It, right, it's, it's not, not bringing home wild bear or something like that. No, nope, so she's got to make it in such a way that it'll pass the test, I guess. Rebecca then took the best clothes of Esau, her older son, which she had in the house, and she put them on Jacob. <coughs> so now she's dressed Jacob in Esau's clothing. And she also covered his hands and the smooth part of his neck with the goat skins. Now, I've been around a few goats. Esau was one hairy guy. One hairy guy. If a goat skin is going to make poor old blind pops mistake Jacob for Esau. But... Mom knows best. She covered Jacob's hands and the smooth part of his neck with the goat skins, and she handed to her son Jacob the tasty food and the bread she had made, and he went into his father and said, My father! And Isaac said, Yes, my son, who is it? And Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. And Isaac asked his son, how did you find it so quickly, my son? <laughs> and so now this is, ah. Uh, so now Jacob says, Yahweh, your God gave me success. Oh, oh boy. boy. So now Jacob is pulling God into this. He's trying to make God a co-conspirator in this thing. Jacob really, in the book of Genesis, just doesn't come out very well. He just doesn't. You will see later stories. He just doesn't. He's basically shown to be a man of questionable morals, willing to, uh, you know, cut corners. He, later on, he showed to be a man of little courage. Um, but God's purposes are working through him and I guess we can take some comfort from that that God's God can work his purposes through the those you know through the weakest of us through anyone that um, God doesn't have to have an upright faithful person um, to work his purposes through. You'd kind of think so, because that, that's, that's the way the world works, and that would make sense to us. But for God, no, no. God is going to work, God's going to work his purposes forward through these very, very questionable characters. And of course, and of course, how would God be known to his people? As a God of whom? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob repeated over and over in Scripture. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of faithful Jacob and not so moral Jacob. Uh, God of faithful Abraham and not so moral Jacob. So anyway, Jacob says, well, the Lord your God gave me success, Dad. That's how come I was able to go out and kill a bear and bring it back and skin it and cook it and 45 minutes. <laughs> so then Isaac said to Jacob, well, come near so I can touch you, my son. You know whether you really are my son Esau or not. Maybe it's the voice. Maybe the food's a little off. Isaac's got a question. He just wants to be sure. Maybe Isaac knows his wife. Maybe there have been other issues in their marriage because of their choice of favorite sons. 
that makes Isaac a little bit suspicious, a little bit questioning about this. So Jacob went close to his father Isaac, who touched him and said, The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. So now we know that Isaac's suspicions are aroused here. Verse 23. He did not recognize him, for his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau. So Isaac proceeded to bless him. Are you really my son Esau? The old man asked. And Jacob replied, I am. So numerous opportunities for Jacob to back out, numerous opportunities for Rebecca to intervene and put a stop to this theft because that's what it is. This is a, this is a theft of the blessing. Then the old man said, then Isaac said, my son, bring me some of your game to eat so that I may give you my blessing. And Jacob brought it to him and he ate and he brought some wine and Isaac drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Come here, my son, and kiss me. So then he went to him and kissed him. You see how the rider's building up little piece after little piece after little piece on top. It's just making it worse and worse and worse. Right? Rather than being a faithful son to his father, he's the picture of unfaithfulness. Lying, lying, lying. This would be so stressful on Jacob who's trying to pull this off. I mean, his dad basically knows something really big is wrong here, but I just can't figure it out. Oh, my gosh. It's. But Jacob is pressing on right ahead, is. each little piece of it. However stressed he might be or not, he has a goal in mind. Yeah. He well, got the birthright. Mother, his mother had a goal yeah. in mind. Yeah, but the, Jacob's going to be the happy recipient because he has, he got the birthright for the bowl of stew, and now he's going to end up with the blessing. 27. So, Jacob went to him, and he kissed Isaac. When Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, remember she had given him Esau's clothes? So he smells like Esau? Each little piece of this is woven together. He said, Isaac blessed him and said, Ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that Yahweh has blessed. Hmm. I'll have to talk that over with Chris and Matt sometime and Robbie. May God give you heaven's dew and earth's richness, an abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers. And may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed and those who bless you be blessed. So there it is. This extravagant blessing is given to the second son um, by means of theft and means of deception and lies. Yet, what did before the babies were born what did God tell Rebecca? That the older will serve the younger. And now it's coming to pass. So you could ask yourself, well, maybe Rebecca's whole deal in this is that she remembers what God had told her 40 years before, about, and she is now conniving to make that happen. She is the one who's going to figure out how to make it happen, and so she does. And so, um, but I guess my take on this is that even if that is what is in her mind, that she's going to bring God's promises to pass, treachery, deception, lying, cheating are never God's ways. And those means, in theory, to accomplish a good end are not acceptable. It's not true that the end justifies the means. And the reason is because we don't ever know what the end would be. Let's just imagine for a minute that God had 
a way that God was going to make this work out where, where Jacob would emerge as the heir of the promise. But it's not this way. It's a different way. Well, she's taken it out of God's hands. And how has she done it? By lying, deception, cheating, trickery, right? So, no, um, it's not true that the means that the end justifies the means, because we can never really know what the end is until you get there. And so, but the upshot of this, or whatever it is, however it came to be, whatever behind it, the upshot of it is that Jacob now has a birthright. Jacob has the blessing, and he will be the one the promise passes through, not his older brother Esau. So just as the promise went from Abraham to Isaac and not to Isaac's older brother Ishmael, remember? Now the promise is going to pass from um, Isaac to Jacob, not to his older brother Esau. And there's, in scripture, there's this whole second son thing that runs on because it subverts the way of the world. It's like this little reminder that, yes, there is a world's way. And the world's ways are things go to the eldest son, it's primogeniture, all that kind of stuff. But the world's ways are not God's ways. They're just not. And here... Jacob, after all the conniving and all the rest of it, is going to he emerges with a blessing because once they once Isaac's given, he can't take it back. Once it's given, it's given, it's passed from Isaac to Jacob. It's now Jacob's, and Isaac has no way to go and wrest it back from from Jacob. They're not just words. The words. This is a this is a place where it's it's, it's we don't think about things this way so much, but these words. This blessing has real substance. It's like something you could hold, something you could keep in a chest, something that you could keep in a safe deposit box. They're not just words. They're words that um, they're words that create something. Uh, how about this? Like when the pastor in a marriage ceremony says, "I do." Those words are not just words. The words create something. So these words here are creating something. And what they're creating is that Jacob is the recipient of the promise. That the great and extravagant promises made to Isaac in, in the previous chapter, they are now going to be Jacob's, not, not Esau's. It's what the words create. They can't be uncreated in that way. Patty held up the question sheet to me again. Well, you had a comment by Kathy Pound saying that Rebecca showed a lack of faith here. You know, she's somebody who again took things into her own hands. Like Sarah. Like Sarah. Exactly. But here is the uh, here. It, yes, absolutely. But here is the here's the other perspective that goes with it. God works through us, right? Jesus yes. says, "Go make disciples of all nations." You know, be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. So, so God works through us. So, how do we discern when we should act? And when we shouldn't act, when we should wait for God rather than take the initiative ourselves. I'm just saying it's it's yeah. it's pretty hard. It's pretty not hard. really straightforward. But here's what I do know. Okay. I do know that cheating, conniving, deception, trickery, and theft, those are not God's ways. And that's what Rebecca had. In that way, Rebecca and Sarah's are really two different stories. It's not unusual what Sarah did. She sent a slave girl in to get pregnant by her husband so that Sarah would have a child. And that's happened. In that world, it happened. That's the way it would work. But this is clearly deception, cheating, trickery. There's no ancient customs or anything that would, that would call this right or good. So, anything else there, Patty? We did have one other, well, actually two other questions. Um, Patty Hoff wanted to know, um, if the birthright is given through trickery, wouldn't it be like null and void? Why does it stay? Nope. Up? Nope. Remember, we have a birthright and a blessing. So the birthright is exchanged for the bowl of stew. In this case, the blessing is stolen. And the blessing, it can't. It just can't be taken back. It's a thing. It's a thing. And it's like Isaac has given it to Jacob, and he can't take it back. He can't make it null and void. 
when the theft is successful, it's successful. It's so weird. It's just, we don't, we don't treat things that way. We try to sometimes in courts when we have people put hands on Bibles, you know, and, and swear to them and so forth, but words like this would just not, they just don't function in our world the way a blessing like this functioned in the ancient world. And then um, just one step fro yeah. fro further, Linda Waldo was asking, let's say Esau had received the blessing from his father and then died, would the blessing then be passed on through Jacob after Esau's death? It would death? go to Esau's um, children. Esau's children, okay. And if he didn't have children, then his wife would be expected to be married to his brother and get pregnant and when that child is born wow. the birthright would be that child's wow. which was a way of keeping it it what okay what does what what does a birthright accomplish this is land livestock that kind of thing it's a way of holding it together okay. of trying to trying to keep it all so if you have a big that's how it worked in england and in, in europe where everything would go to the eldest son and the second son would join the army and the third son would become a uh, priest. So the eldest son would get everything. Why would the eldest son get everything? Because it keeps it all together. Yeah. Otherwise, you end up chopping it up and splitting it up and after a while, you know, everybody's got a little bit. Yeah. And so the, the only way to keep the estates together were to give them in toto to the eldest or to somebody. I guess it still works like that now with royalty because if Prince Charles is next in line, and if something happens to him, it goes to his son William. It doesn't go to his brother Andrew. It That's goes correct. to Charles's son, and then if William passes away, it is goes Andrew to Andrew Prince Charles's brother? Yes. I didn't know that. He's the queen. He's well, I don't the know. The queen's son. Yeah. Is he Andrew? Is Elizabeth's son? You see, I don't really keep up with that, do I? <laughs> And then, he's the one, and he's the one who's in all the trouble lately, right? Yes. And then if wow. something happened to William, even though his little boy is just this little boy, it would go to him instead of going to Harry. Yes. Yeah, so I guess it is kind, of, kind the of the same. same still, thing. They still do that same kind thing. Kind of the same thing. So wow. So we're going to we'll come back to the story, and it's not done yet, but we'll pick it up next week, um, and we'll see the outcome of it because it's there is. From the perspective of Rebecca, I don't think things work out quite as she would have expected them to. So you'll have to tune in next week <laughs> to see what. We'll be here. We'll be here, yes. Yeah, still here. COVID's out there. We're in here. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So. Okay. Just. We thank you for being here. We hope to see you Sunday at 11. You'll see us, but we'll see your names, and we know you're there, and that, that it makes us happy. Um, and Scott puts a lot of time into prepping for these classes, so that I know I, I know that makes him happy that people are watching them. So I am just going to give a very thankful prayer today. Okay, baby. Yeah, so please join just me pray in prayer. Pray out of here, honey. Lord, we are, we are just so blessed. God, thank you so much. Thank you for this day that's a little bit cooler than some of the days we've had. Thank you, God, for all the blessings that each one of us has right now. We are truly, we, we are a grateful people, God, but I know sometimes when, you know, our world isn't perfect, we tend to see a lot of the, the negative stuff instead of the positive. And Lord, you have just been so faithful to us. And we pray, God, that we can be that faithful to you. We know, God, that in a group this big, there are a lot of joys and there are a lot of concerns that are on people's hearts. And we're just going to lift them up to you, God, through your Holy Spirit today. You know each and every one of those concerns. We pray, God, that you would keep us all close to you, that we would feel your presence, God, in our lives every day. And we pray, God, that you would bring us all back together next Tuesday, hopefully Sunday and Monday too. And Lord, just, just thank you. Please, just, just thank you, God. We are so grateful for everything you've done for us. We're grateful for this, the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So thank you all. Adios. Bye, Enjoy guys. the cool weather today.
and we will see you another time. adios, amigos.